gather around and feast your eyes and do put in the comments if you know what quote that film is from. And if you guess, you win absolutely bugger all. But anyway, I'm back with my stay in the multiverse. Thank you so much for all your patience. And judging by Ben's where we are going to be talking about something which is going to be pretty obvious, which we're getting it for some reason two days earlier than America is for whatever reason. Don't ask why. But yes, we're going to be talking about Spider-Man no way home it's probably going to be the spider-man film of all films and i don't even know where to start there is a lot to cover this bit and there's theories you know there's theories there's a lot of speculation uh when debate whether to- whether toby and andrew are going to be in the film or whatsoever but it's pretty much a done deal that they are going to be pretty much in the film otherwise what's the point but yeah anyway there's a lot to go and there's a lot to go over there's so much to discuss <sighs> Where do we even start? I suppose what we can do is just speculate on what we've seen in the trailers and also in the TV spots so far. So, obviously, this is going to be the biggest Spider-Man film today. Like it is a, basically more of a fan service film than it is in terms of any major plot. Not that we're complaining. <laughs> oh, no, of course not. But the thing that we are trying to cover the most is obviously we've seen Green Goblin being revealed, we've seen Electro, and we have seen Doc Ock. But we've seen next to nothing in terms of Lizard, and we've had a few tidbits of Sandman, but I have this horrible feeling that it's only going to focus on the first three villains because they were such an like, important role in terms of a bad guy. Sandman was more of a mix of bad guys with Venom and whatever else happened in that terrible movie. And Lizard was a decent bad guy, but was just poorly executed. Yeah, well, I mean, it's going to be pretty much it's pretty much a very cut and dry, the Sinister Six sort of deal, which um don't understand the point having the five. But then we were trying to speculate. So we got, uh, obviously, Doc Ock, Green Goblin, Electro, Lizard... Sandman, and we're just speculating on who the sixth one is going to be. And no, I think over time, ever since we've heard about this film, we've had a few uh, different sort of ideas. Uh, one of them, some of them are a bit far fetched, but not out of the realms of possibility. So we've had the possibility that this, I think I was the one who came up with this the possibility that Mysterio may not be dead, may not be dead. Yeah, so between the two of us, we think it's a bit of a cop-out as to how easy Mysterio was conveniently killed off at the end of the movie. It just seems a bit bizarre. And I mentioned to Jack that obviously at the end of the movie, there's the random guy that he works with, with the hardware of Mysterio, that all gets uploaded and then he walks off. Why would he do that? What reason would he have to do that if it wasn't that they switched places? Well, it just seems like a bit of a wicked waste to me. (laughs) This is it. So my theory going with the movie is that, yes, obviously Spider-Man's going to probably retain some of his identity being exposed. However, I think it's also going to be revealed that Mysterio, Mysterio didn't actually die and that it was an illusion that was used on his henchmen that took the place of him. They switched places, and Mysterio either gets captured by the end of the movie, or is just revealed to be alive still, and so Spidey is somehow exonerated. I don't know. It's hard to say, but it's just, with the whole with the whole plot line, I think um, it's a similar plot line to, what was the comic called? One More Day, wasn't it? To a degree, yes. To a it degree, is... it's a similar sort of storyline that we also had the the theory, and we can only speculate from the trailer. Obviously, it's a little bit, it, it's a bit a little, it's a little bit touch and go. It could go either way. So you know, we had the option that it could be Mysterio, which I think it very well might be. Uh, the very least likely one for me is Venom, because now we've seen from the end credit scene at the end of Venom, let there be carnage. Is that obviously now? He's obviously, Eddie Brock is aware, Venom, they are aware of Tom Holland's Spider-Man. So they're obviously going to be in that universe. But then I said to Ben, I reckon, and this is a far-fetched theory that in the beginning, Venom, Eddie Brock was never in Tom Holland's universe to begin with. I reckon he was in Andrew's universe because he can't be in Toby's. Yeah, I reckon he was in Andrew's universe. And then through, obviously, the spell going kaput, 
ended up in Tom Holland's universe. But that is just my theory anyway. But I don't see him truly being that Sinister Six member. I don't just don't see it. I think in a weird way, it's more... He's going to... He could end up towards the end of the movie. He could be a very random moment in which one Spider-Man may get a brief upgrade. I mean, as a random stretch in the dark, obviously, Toby Spider-Man has had experience with symbiotes. What if one bizarre thing is that as he's got older, his powers have been more unreliable, as we saw, was it in the second movie, where his web powers just sort of came and went every so often? yeah. So what if the, it's getting to the point where his powers, where he isn't able to use his organic webbing as efficiently, and Venom's there, and he go, he realises it's a symbiote, so they fuse together in some way, because he knows how to use it? Uh, bit of a I stretch mean, for me, still. It's a, bit, it's a bit of a stretch, but considering, like, obviously, Andrew has not come across the symbiote, and neither has Tom... Toby yeah. Spider-Man's the only one that may have some degree of understanding of what to do with it. And obviously within the comics, they revealed, I think it was last year, maybe earlier on this year, that symbiotes can basically contact each other via different dimensions. They are multiversal. So it wouldn't be out the realms of possibility too far-fetched that it's had some understanding of what a Spider-Man is. Yeah, and obviously, like they were all connected by like the hive mind as well. Yes. And then the other one, which I, unless you have any other suggestions, which I think it was Ben who came up with this one, that the Doctor Strange that we have in this film might not be Doctor Strange. Yeah. So, for those of you who've been watching the Disney Plus series of all the Marvel stuff, obviously we had What If. And within the What If series, there was a dark version of Doctor Strange who is stupidly overpowered, being basically the anti-Doctor Strange is the only way I can explain it, where he is so dark and twisted. But it wouldn't be too far-fetched in terms of the two of them switching places because they are the exact same person, just different multiverse. Yeah, sure. But then the question would argue as to why. Because at the end of the What If episodes that we've got so far, he goes back to his own dimension, although it's literally now a pocket dimension, not a full dimension. Why would he want to leave? I mean, it would be cool if they had switched places, but to what point? Like, what is he going to get from it? Well, I know some people may have have, been speculating online, especially in like Reddit forums and such that it possibly could be a precursor to Mephisto, but I just... I feel like Mephisto is a character you have to set up the origins first before you can introduce him into this. Especially, I feel if you introduce Mephisto into this film, just out of the blue, saying there's Doctor Strange, just go, wait, what? Who's Mephisto? You know, because there's going to be people coming to see it who may not have seen the other two Spider-Men or may not know who Mephisto is. But the thing is, as well, is that Mephisto is a very obscure but quite a vital character for quite a lot of people, including Ghost Rider. Yeah. Whether or not if we could ever get any more of that in the future would be cool because although Nicolas Cage was really bad as Ghost Rider, it was quite a decent set of movies. But the thing is with Mephisto is obviously he's meant to represent being the devil within Marvel, which is a whole other kettle of fish that I don't think Disney want to touch. No. <laughs> but the thing is... The main point, I think, within the whole scope of this movie is Spider-Man taking responsibility for being Spider-Man. I mean, we've had like little hints along the way that with great power comes great responsibility, but he's not actually said it. Primarily, no. of course, because obviously Sony owns more Spider-Man than Disney does, but it's still... In some weird way, it sort of needs to be said because that's the point of Spider-Man is that despite all the power he has, he needs to have the right amount of responsibility to go along with it. Otherwise, it can make him a pretty shitty character. Well, to be honest, I feel like the best... I feel like the best Spider-Man out of all three of them to sort of teach Tom that lesson. I really reckon that Tobey Maguire is going to be sort of the... Mm. 
the Spider-Man that's going to be like more of the teacher, sort of a bit more of the leader to really teach like Tom, look, I've gone through all these things in my world and I've suffered so much and that I want to, and it's kind of going to be, I reckon that Toby's going to sort of be, since he's, I wouldn't say really the older Spider-Man, but he's but probably, more experience. yeah, the most experienced and the more sort of iconic. But then again, you know, if we got Doc Ock from the point where I'm just, because it's funny, it's after he knows that Peter's identity, that's when he switches like from being bad to being good. But then you hear him say, you know, Peter, when he's on the bridge with Tom. So then, you know, why is he still eating? You know, there's a lot of que- there's a lot of questions, but we'll get there. We'll get there. And so I just reckon that Toby's going to be the much more sort of wiser one to really, because throughout all the films, it was really, in Toby's films, it was drummed in that with great power comes great responsibility. So I just reckon that Toby's going to be the much more of the, sort of the matriarch of the free Spider-Man, I think. Mm. The thing is, as well, is I said to Jack that considering that Toby Spider-Man is the only one that has organic webbing, he would probably be the best one to be a mentor to explain to the other two how to use the webbing more efficiently. Because they rely on web shooters, obviously they just go, and that's it. But the thing is, as well, is I don't think Toby Spidey did a lot of very imaginative spider, spider webbing. But Andrew's Spider-Man behaved more of a spider in terms of fight style. Because when he's yeah. up against the lizard, he literally goes around the body, like round and round, webbing him up like an actual spider. Yeah. So I think, to be fair, they're all going to learn off each other in some bizarre way to another. But I think, obviously, Tom Spider-Man's got the most to learn from both because he... Don't get me wrong, it's great having Spidey in the MCU, but it's frustrating that he's relying on Stark tech constantly. Yeah, it's just, I I am hoping, I'm hoping that, because obviously we still have like the Iron Spider suit and everything, but then again, like from what we see, like during the, which I'm assuming is the very end fight, that we see he's got the, isn't he got the regular suit back? It's a hybrid one. It's I'm, actually... I'm hoping that, Eventually, because like me and Ben have been having this moan for ages that, you know, Tony Stark's dead and we need to let Stark be friggin' dead and like stop piggybacking off, piggybacking off his like tech and his name and so on. I think, but I think hopefully this is going to be the film where obviously we see that Doc Ock, you know, gets some sort of upgrade, like through like nanobots, I'm assuming. Maybe Green Goblin might as well, but I very much doubt because he lo- does look slightly different in the film. He does have a much different look and without the mask, but. I'm hoping that we're going to hopefully do away with that because I feel like films, especially a lot of films pushing forward in Marvel, have relied too much on the whole Stark tech or, like, you know, and the whole Mysterio being connected, like, hate Tony Stark and so on. It's just, just let Tony Stark be dead. <laughs> the thing is, is that obviously they're trying to pay homage to how much of a big role Iron Man had because obviously without that movie none of the MCU would be where it is today. Yeah. But there has to be a goddamn point where other characters can flourish without having to be reminded that Iron Man used to be a part of the universe as well. Yeah. I mean, we have so many characters and so many shows, so many series and so many films that are going to be coming out that don't need to be twisted and manipulated within the whole realm of what Iron Man was. No. But yeah. The thing is, is obviously from what we can gather with its movies that perhaps at least one, if not two villains do get captured within the film quite easily. Spidey realises that Doctor Strange is going to send them back to their deaths. Being Spidey, he's trying to do the best he can for them both. And that's where we end up being, they get released again and we get screwed. And that's where the big fight in the trailer comes from. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, like, is it going to only focus, as I said earlier, on Electro, Goblin and Doc Ock? And then the other ones are just going to be there because, and that's it. Because we haven't seen... Sandman be in his normal form. We've only seen him in the dust form of sand, and we haven't seen Lizard in his human form. He's only been in the lizard form, and for whatever reason, he's roaring like a dinosaur. Because well, even little details which people might have missed in the trailer is that 
since we're on the subject of Stark, even if you look at Electro's costume, even if you go just go frame by frame, he has like what looks like a mini arc reactor on his chest, doesn't he? Yes, he does. The theory going is that the arc reactor, instead of being a power source, is more of a way of stabilising him. That's why he looks more human and less blue. So he's able to regulate his power. Yes, which is a good idea. But the thing that someone posted up I saw in a group that I follow made me laugh is, how the hell did he get his hair back? Yeah, because I sent you that picture and just like, first of all, he's got hair, he's changed colour. <laughs> but it's just like, well, in Amazing Spidey, he's got like the most bizarre looking comb over and he's got really wonky teeth. He comes, gets into the MCU, he's got hair and he's had a dental plan, apparently. Yeah, for just because. Yeah. But the other thing as well is we... We're wondering like how long they have been within the whole MCU. Because obviously the characters get plucked out at random points in time, but do they all get dispersed at the same time? Do they appear at different times? Well, it just makes me think, because obviously we got the MCU, which you know, in the MCU, the Spider-Man that we got is Tom Holland, but then it does make me think, you know, with all these villains and me and with Toby and Andrew being in this film. Does that mean that they are in the MCU Virus Association? Is I mean, that a little loophole? <laughs> I think it's playing off the whole fact that it's the MCU multiverse. So yes, but no, but yes, but no. Yes, but no. I mean, the thing is, is obviously the multiverse, as we said before, is going to be the biggest part of the MCU going forward. It's going to be everything cosmic is going to be related. We got Doctor Strange 2, the multiverse of madness which is going to have some implications of what could have been. Supposedly, we are meant to be getting a variant of Tony Stark that could be Tom Cruise, because originally that's who was meant to be Iron Man before Yeah, because okay. you lot didn't know, now you do. <laughs> but whether it would be more of an Easter egg thing or whether it would be actually vital to the movie, it begs the question as to which other multiversal things is going to be important down the road. Yeah. Yeah, it's just... Uh, obviously, like when I was saying about all these different villains, where if you're having the same villains, I mean, we've got, like, J. Jonah Jameson pretty much in every one of the Spider-Man films. Like, it's, it's like they got to be. But even if you rewatch the second Amazing Spider-Man with Andrew Garfield is that when Norman's walking through Oscorp down in the lab, you see, like, Vulture's wings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you see the mech armor for the rhino. Don't quote, don't be certain on that, because I can't remember properly. But I know for sure in that scene there's Doc Ock's arms in there. So his one has a version of Doc Ock. But it does make me think, you know, when I said to Ben, at uh, what point, in, when these villains all come in, when they start coming into uh tom's universe just makes think have they all come into that one universe like tom's universe or have all of these different universes in the multiverse been smashed together so it does make me think what point in time do all the villains come from and at what point in time do andrew and tom come in so in my opinion at least with andrew garfield's one with the clips that we've seen where he's on the bridge, I would assume that Doctor Strange takes uh, Tobey Maguire and Tom Holland to his universe to collect him. The only way I can assume is obviously, why would Andrew Garfield be sucked into a portal? It makes no sense. But in the clip that we've seen, although we don't have any idea what he's saying, he looks very distraught, he looks very upset, I'm wondering if it's moments after Gwen Stacy's died. Maybe so. So, because the thing is, is obviously he looks very, he looks very broken. Obviously, it does take time for any normal person to heal from a tragedy. But he wouldn't be that distraught if it was months or maybe years after. No, because I think the next time that we saw, like when we saw Andrew at the very end of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I think that's like a year after Gwen Stacy's death, I think. Something like that. So he has had some time to heal. So then what if some bizarre way 
the reason why he heals quicker in terms of emotionally at the end of his own movie is because he's had a redemption to save somebody within Tom's universe. And so he doesn't feel so guilty in the end. That's why I said, uh, that's why I said, I was like, there is no, even though we see it in the trailer, trailers are very good at being deceiving because sometimes, like Ben said to me, you see there will be scenes in the trailer which are not going to be in the film. And there's going to be like scenes in the film that were never in the trailer. So it does make me think, even though we see in that scene at the very end of the trailers when, Tom Holland jumps down to save his version of Mary Jane. I don't reckon it will be Tom Holland saving Mary Jane. I think it will be Andrew because he'll remember that he couldn't, well, he couldn't save Gwen Stacy just because of the whiplash effect with the web and she hit her head on the ground dead. But I just think it would be some sort of a redemption in Andrew's sort of way. So he's like, I can't, I couldn't save Gwen, but I can save Tom's, you know, this Peter Parker's Mary Jane, if that makes sense. Yeah. But then the other thing as well is theory going is that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man is technically the MCU equivalent of Uncle Ben. Supposedly Tom Tobey Maguire, him as like a person within the MCU, is meant to be the MCU's Uncle Ben, which I can kind of get, but then... It'd be incredibly confusing. Yeah. I mean, this is why, of all three of them, he's obviously going to be the senior version. He's going to be the one that's going to be the mentor well, mentor to them all. But the thing is, as well, is the last the last part of his trilogy is basically what mary jane leaves harry she stays with toby and that's it like they have the happy ending harry's dead but that's about it well the ending of spider-man 3 was a like, really somber is obviously like harry's dead then my like, peter goes back to the nightclub where she works they have a little dance then fades to black and that's it so one would argue what if I have this feeling that the two of them could end up together. What if they had this, uh, they hint towards the idea that he is actually a dad? Because in one reality, Spider-Man does have a daughter with MJ, that's Mayday Parker, and she does become Spider-Woman in her reality as Peter loses his powers. Yeah, true, but it's just, it would just, like, for me, it would just... Because again, it goes back to the whole anything to do with time travel and anything to do with like other dimensions, it causes more questions than it does answers. Because I think surely for any sort of logic, for me, if Doc Ock is coming from that certain point in time, because in the trailer he's asking about his machine, and in that there's short clips of the film which have been released when he like says to Tom Holland's Peter, believing that that's Toby's Peter, saying, What have you done with my machine? So it does beg the question that, you know, okay, if Doc Ock's coming from this point in the Spider-Man 2 film, isn't Tobey Maguire going to come from that same point? Or is he going to come from, like, maybe Spider-Man 3 or later? Well, this is why I am trying to figure out in terms of how time-displaced all of these characters are. Because yeah. Green Goblin obviously died the year before Doc Ock turned up, which makes it even more of a head-scratchy argument as to when and where all these characters come from. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing like the arc which these characters are going to have. Because I said to Ben that if Doc Ock, like he did have his redemption at the end of Spider-Man Two, and he did die a hero by like destroying the machine and obviously killing himself in the process. So then it makes me think: if he just goes back to like just be obviously he's evil, like as we see like in the trailer, which I'm assuming, and well. It's not really assuming he is going to be evil at the start, but I reckon as the film goes on, I think he's probably going to have a much more of a better redemption story, I think. Because otherwise, for me, it would just be such a waste of that story and a waste of that character's redemption. But I'm glad that we're going to see Willem Dafoe back in light as the evil goblin. But now, you know, there's a point where we get to see, you know, we see in the latest trailers that his mask is broken and... I assume it's him running away because it looks like the green legs of the costume and we will see him like in sort of like more rags and sort of the iconic purple hood and we actually see his face now. 
So I just think we're going to see a much more unhinged, like more than we saw Green Goblin. Definitely. Although, to be fair, the one thing that always makes me laugh is Jack sent me a picture of a still where he's throwing the pumpkin bomb into the cafe. And yeah, it's just. And it looks like that. He's got the dark face. It's such a weird, derpy face. But the thing is, it's just. William Defoe is the perfect person to be the Green Goblin because he has a very pointy goblin face already. Mm. But it's so weird. I mean, the thing that I really don't get, though, is the we've had, like, two different points in the trailer showing the goblin, but one glider looks like Harry's, one looks like the original one. Which one? Oh, oh I know what you mean. I know what you mean. It's- yeah. Yeah, when we see one of them in like the moonlight coming down and he's got all these drones by the side of him, then that makes me think, okay, is Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin going to get some sort of Stark tech as well, maybe? Well, I mean, I'm assuming like two degree, three of the villains will need Stark tech, but I don't know. I mean, why? It just seems a bit of a random thing for him to just want drones when because looking back on spider-man 3 obviously there is the whole hangar of the green goblin and there's all those other pumpkin bombs that have the ability to fly yeah and it just it begs the question was it they only existed because he made them in the mcu and they came back with him or did they already exist yeah, because I was just like, okay, you know. But then again, going back to the, like the um, the nanotech, like the nanotech, which we see in the trailer, it's pretty obvious. You know, we're going to see Doc Ock. You know, he has the red arms, which which we can assume is the like. Because I watched this from. I forgive me for the channel. I cannot remember, but it was another channel which pointed this out, which actually made me go, okay, it's a really good point. Which makes us think that. The Iron Spider suit that Tom Holland wears is going to be damaged somehow because you see when he's hanging upside down, it retracts away from his face to reveal his face and goes onto his chest. So it makes you think that the chest is maybe damaged, and that's when he gets the well, that's when he gets the nanotech on the arms. And so it does make me think when he does when Doc Ock does get those nanotech bots onto his arms, I wonder if he's actually going to like regain full control of the arms again. I mean, to a degree, yes. The thing that we were trying to figure out is obviously he has some sort of sense of normality because the nanites could be either fixing the inhibitor chip or blocking the confusion between the tentacles and him. But then it's one of these weird things that could it be, obviously, the reason why the nanites go onto the arms is more of a deactivation measure that he uses on Doc Ock to lock the tentacles. Because when you watch it in slow-mo, all the bits of the Stark tech that go around the tentacles, yeah, they look true. yeah, they look really blocky. They look like they're trying to stop the tentacles, not upgrade them. It does look that way. Because so, what you see in like the rest of the scenes that we see when Doc Ock has the red arms... Like when, like when the mechanical arms are red, in every scene that we've seen in the trailers, they're always closed. They're never open. So it makes mm. you think, is it some sort of a locking mechanism in a way? It's almost like it's trying to take over the technology. But maybe that's the reason why the suit appears damaged. is because it takes a lot of energy for the nanites to do it. So there's less power within Spidey suit. But there's one really funny scene in the trailer, which I can't wait to see in the actual film. Is when you go, like, in your world, is there a Peter Parker? Yes. Is that him? No. No. <laughs> no, there was a meme I sent Jack the other day I saw on TikTok, and he goes, is that him? And it's just in a constant loop of all these different other Spider-Man characters. No. Is that him? No. Is that no. him? Is no. that him? No. It's just... <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is Doctor Strange is pretty much a very sassy guy, but it's kind of weird that obviously Benedict Cumberbatch plays Doctor Strange so well, despite being the British actor. Oh, he's a, yeah, but fantastic Doctor Strange. But the only thing is about Doctor Strange, which everybody is speculating, what's the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> well, 
the thing I can imagine is that the box is in some bizarre way, it's almost like trying to capture the bad guys. It's almost like a mystic equivalent of Proto Pack from Ghostbusters, if you think about yeah. it. But why would Doctor Strange do that? What what would be the point of entangling them all in one box? I mean, doesn't he have? I mean, isn't there like the the prison and well, like the bottom of the Sanctum Sanctorum? Well, I think the way in which it could be they're both linked. So it could be that the box is like a containment box, which then causes them to pocket into a containment unit within the Sanctum. Maybe. If that makes sense. It's more of like it goes. They go into the box, and then the box obviously transfers into the sanctum. It's like a pocket between the two. The, the thing which, like anything to do with, like especially with this, which I am bloody excited for this film. I've never been so excited for a film before, like more than Endgame, because you know we've seen the original Spider-Man. We've seen Tobey Maguire when it first came out. We're, like we're old enough to remember that. Maybe some of you kids aren't. Um, now we've seen Tobey Maguire, seen Andrew, and now we're seeing all three of them in a film. Like, I never thought this would happen in my lifetime, I could never imagine this. However, something about this film is just really bugging me because we've seen the events of the films play out as they have done for Toby from one to three and Andrew once two. Except, I'm wondering if there's going to be any changes, like if these vil all these villains are going to die within Tom Holland's universe, will they die in a different way? They don't die within their own respective universe. How is that going to bugger up their own timelines? You know what I mean? Well, the thing is, is obviously with Endgame is that they play off the idea that when you change something in the timeline, it doesn't affect the timeline currently. It just branches off and creates a completely different universe. Yeah. So. The argument... well, we can only go off the we can only go off that logic because at least at least with Infinity, Infinity War and Endgame actually set some rules, you know. But then, to be fair, rules are made to be broken. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, is obviously, if this is the case that the timeline splits, if they don't go into the back home to where they're supposed to, what other chaos could it implement? Exactly, because. If you think about it, if Doc Ock is plucked before he's... Because when he's in that scene in the trailer where he's first fighting Tom Holland, he says, what have you done with my machine? So this yeah. is obviously... It could be literally at the moment when he's messing with the machine. Yeah, what if in that... The only thing is, it wasn't until Tobey Maguire took his mask off and revealed that he was Peter Parker, then he knew... That was him because before he had no idea. So it just makes things like right when they were in the dock and he knocks him into the water and then he he takes off his mask and says, we have to shut down the machine. Is he plucked right then? Well, no, I got a feeling it's before that. I, think I don't think it is, to be honest, because he didn't know his identity until that scene. I don't know. I mean, it's a lot of speculation, but... I don't know, it's so weird because if that's the case, if that's the moment in which he's get plucked from his reality... Then surely Toby has to be as well. There is that. Although, there's also, we why would he... an older Toby. There's also the fact that why would he be fighting Spider-Man? If he's been redeemed at that point, why would he start flinging and start attacking Spider-Man? Yeah, which I'm hoping we do get an answer to, although Green Goblin... If he's plucked from that time where he's obviously... Because I think even though it's not explicitly stated, but that Norman Osborn and Green Goblin, it's sort of like a split personality sort of thing that mm -hmm. they've got going on. So, but then mind you, I think Green Goblin has pretty much always been evil. So that's pretty easy to bring back. And I'm looking forward to seeing the Green Goblin back again. But I think the thing which kicked off, I think everybody was hoping and sort of knew that all three Spider-Men were going to be in this film. But it really, really, really kicked off when we saw the trailer. When because I think I think Sony like they noticed this mistake really quickly and went, "Oh Christ, we screwed up." Because you see, when Tom Holland is the one who leaps at all the villains, 
who's Electro aiming at, and the lizard gets punched by nothing. <laughs> yeah. See, I don't understand. Why would you add that scene in for a trailer if you're trying to speculate, oh, no, there is no other Spider-Man. Well, what the fudge hit him? The Invisible Woman? And who are the and who's Lizard and Electro aiming for? But this is it. I mean, it's obviously that they're going to be there. Oh, it's obvious. But apparently, as well, I don't know how true this is. The actor that pl- did the voice work for the '90s Spider-Man cartoon series might be in it as just like a Easter egg. Yes. <laughs> I mean, obviously, he wouldn't be Spider-Man. But what if some bizarre way he could be in the courtroom scene, like towards the end of the movie? Yeah, like even if it's just his voice, you know, his cameo playing the judge or something. Well, it's either that. I mean, a lot of us have speculated that Daredevil is going to be Spider-Man's Yeah, lawyer. I was just about to get on to this. But what if in some bizarre twist that it's not Daredevil at the beginning, but it's the actor that did the 90 Spider-Man voice originally? Maybe. It'd be a really nice Easter egg. So it could be that he's the lawyer at first, but for some reason maybe it's just like Aunt May runs out of money, or maybe something happens to the guy, so they have to replace him later on, towards the end of the movie, and this is where we get Daredevil. Yeah, quite possibly. Because while it would be great to see Devil- Daredevil at the beginning of the movie, it wouldn't have the same impact, because obviously he's not vital to the movie. Why would he be at the beginning? It only no, makes sense I mean, if at the end. No, I mean, with no way home, with this sort of film, it has to be a slow burn. It has to be a slow burn. Yeah. Which, because this film, because we, because like guys, we're depending on when this video comes out, we're seeing it this Wednesday and we're doing this on the Sunday. Yeah. And I am freaking buzzed. I cannot wait. And like the cinema, I imagine, is going to be packed and there's going to be a lot of people screaming. But yes. The thing is about no, about no way home, there is. Just too much speculation to go around. There's all these thoughts which are really screwing with my mind. But then the benefits with the sort of the more multiversal kind of stories, it opens up the door to so many other stories. Like we've got the Man Spider story, which is one of my favorite stories of all time. Because you've also got more, you've got like Morbius versus Blade. You've got Man Spider, Punisher, and you got one of everybody's favourite Marvel characters, the clone, Ben Riley, which I would love to see that story. <laughs> well, this is why I mentioned to Jack that there is another trilogy of Spider-Man that Tom Holland is doing. So obviously Spidey is going to stay for quite a while within the MCU, but to what extent? I would love to see the Clone Saga story, but... I don't fully know if it's going to work if Spider-Man's identity is revealed completely and he still goes about being known as Peter Parker. Well, that's the thing. I don't know. But then again, I think if there's going to be like another three films, since we now like got this whole multiversal thing is now confirmed, that it opens up the door to introduce such an iconic character from the comics and also from the cartoon series, Madam Web. Yes. And I said to Jack that Michelle Pfeiffer would be the perfect actress to be Madame Webb because she's quite yeah. a bony-faced woman. She's very classy. I mean, how old is she now? Oh, how old she got to be now? 60s-ish? Or Some... am I thinking too far? Something like that. So the thing is, is that she played a very good role even though it was a really bad movie where it was um, Curse And a little Stewart. bit of trivia for all you lot as well, in just in case you did not know, is that in the cartoon series, the actress who played Madam Webb was Stan Lee's wife. She was indeed. It was Joan Lee. Mm. But, yeah, so Michelle Pfeiffer would be perfect as Madam Webb. But then there is also... There's technically two versions of Madam Webb. There's yeah. the one that we know about from the cartoon series where she's like a sort of entity that's at the web of reality. But then there's also a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, Madame Webb, who can see the future. Which... Well... I, given the fact that S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't technically exist in the MCU anymore, I would highly doubt we'd get that version. But then again, it would be quite interesting if we had like a weird combination of the both. Yeah. 
because at least it could play off the idea of someone being premonition related so they could warn the other characters in the MCU of Secret Wars, which is a movie in the works. But then it also gives the idea that there is someone that's more connected to the multiverse than Doctor Strange. Yeah. But (sighs) it's one of these things that Spider-Man, they have tweaked and twiddled with his character so many times, got no issues with. However, while it's cool that he is a cosmic totem within the reality of Marvel, it does get a bit zany and a bit out there in terms of how it connects within the rest of the universe or the multiverse. But then the other thing as well is I said to Jack, what would be really cool, I'd know it probably wouldn't happen, but what if Toby Spider-Man was the Easter egg in terms of the man spider story? Because it would make so much more sense that Maybe he tries to get rid of his powers because it's affecting his love life with Mary Jane. And considering how much more inept his powers are connected to the spider, given the fact he's got organic webbing, it makes more sense for him to transform into a man spider than the other two. Yeah, because like the man spider story you have in, I think it was like it was stretched out in two episodes Mm -hmm. or three episodes, but I think it was two. That you have Morbius, who is being hunted by Blade, mm-hmm. and then you've got the Man Spider, which is being hunted by the Punisher, and you've also got the Man Spider, who's also being hunted by Craven as yes. well. It's a very complicated. You can tell it in a cartoon, but for a film, it might be a little bit too much overload. But it is an amazing story. But since we got Morbius coming out, which I believe is an R-rated film. Mm-hmm. So I am really looking forward to that. But obviously, at some point, we're going to have to see uh, Morbius in a Spider-Man film. Because I think that whole that kicks off where he's in the story of where Peter Parker just like, says, no, I am fed up with this and how it's affected my life. There, he realizes that you know he gains nothing from being Spider-Man. It's sort of like what we saw in Spider-Man 2 where Peter Parker just gives up being Spider-Man. But then you may have the Man Spider story where obviously he attempts to try and uh, cure himself of the Spider-Man-ness and then ends up making it a whole lot worse. And that is one of my favourite Spider-Man stories ever because the Man-Spider on screen would be terrifying. (laughs) It would be horrifying. However, it would almost be like uh, a werewolf in London sort of-esque idea where it's random transformations that maybe Spider-Man can't control. Yeah. Because the only thing I didn't like about that story was that the only way he got cured was because he got attacked by the vulture, which in the cartoon and the comics, his powers were very weird that he basically was an old man that siphoned the life energy of people to be young. But then like Morbius got involved somehow. I can't remember how, but... (laughs) It was it was a weird one because obviously I think it was between the two of them that's how he got cured. He becomes an old version of himself. He ends up like seeing Aunt May. Aunt May miss like sort of takes him in, thinking he's some random stranger, and then the vulture just randomly transforms into the man spider thing, and then that's the end of it. I know it's re- even I have seen it loads of times. I still don't one hundred percent get it. I'm surprised how these bloody kids understood it, but no. It does, but only thing is, we've seen Uncle Ben in Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. We've seen Uncle Ben in Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. We haven't seen him in Tom Holland's, however. So well, I reckon, because of like the multiverse and so on, and because of this time displacement, I finally reckon, I don't know why, I've got this feeling that in this film, we are finally going to see a version of Tom Holland's Ben Parker. I think. Well, you say that. However, there is a Disney Plus series coming out, I think, in the next few months about Spidey before Civil War and Uncle Ben's meant to be in that. Yeah. So... Because we haven't actually ever seen his Uncle Ben, have we? No. I think it's one of these weird things with Sony... We've never even seen him get his powers. No. It's one of these weird things with Sony that because they still own more of the rights, they were trying to find a loophole to keep the character, but not be repeating themselves because otherwise Sony would kick off 
because that's where, what Sony does. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, we've also speculated in terms of obviously the new trilogy after this one being about his college years, which would be quite cool. And I would love to see him meet Harry Osborn at college and maybe MJ or maybe Gwen Stacy. But again, what could we have in terms of a new trilogy other than the Clone Saga? I would also argue that maybe bring in the idea of more Lun. Quite possibly, quite possibly. I mean, if we're going to have a new sort of series, I feel like after No Way Home, you can't really do the Green Goblin story again because mm. we've just had Willem Dafoe back and then... It's obviously because if we're going to have Harry in there, fair enough, he meets Harry. But then again, it's going to be like, oh, we know where this is going. We've already seen this. So it does make me think. But I just think that now, since Venom is now aware of Spider-Man, we are going to have a Venom and Spider-Man story now. Yes. That's what I reckon the next film will be. I mean, yeah, I would love to see a Venomized MCU Spidey. But the thing that really confuses me is obviously <sighs> their relationship is a weird one regardless. Like the whole reason why Venom and Spidey have so many fights is because Venom is almost like a crazy ex-girlfriend that couldn't let go. Yeah. But because they've not established that relationship yet, if they were to bring it in, I think it just wouldn't work. Well, the problem is, like I said to you, the problem with the Venom story, don't get me wrong, the Venom films, I really like them. I think they're very well done compared to like the one that we had, the original in the 2007 film. But happily, that is retconned, and I'm happy for that to be dead and gone. But the problem is with this Venom, as good as the films are, they've told the story backwards because the symbiote, as we all know, found peter parker but instead they did it backwards and it found brock first Mm -hmm. which presents so many problems but then the other thing as well is to what extent would what reason would it be that tom holland spidey would want the venom symbiote this is the thing that we were trying to figure out because obviously when spidey finds it in the comics it's because of battle world his costumes completely ruined And that's how he gets the symbiote. Whether or not you could do a similar idea, I don't know. But then, as we said, it's backwards. Like, he's obviously going to have to get rid of the symbiote at some stage. Yeah. But for what reason? Because the only reason why he gets rid of the symbiote is because it makes him toxic. It makes him more aggressive. That's why it happened in the comics. It's why it happened in Spider-Man 3. Yeah. But in the Venom movies, he's not that aggressive. I mean, yes, he does eat people, but he doesn't make people aggressive. He doesn't make them toxic people. He just basically... It's almost like a mixture of a puppy dog and a bulldog. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's big and scary, but it's really cuddly. But it's yeah, big and scary. It's just like, yeah, Venom's scary, but at the same time, you love him. <laughs> yes. But... It's a weird one because this it's the only time we've actually had a Venom symbiote in the movie so far that has a voice. Yeah, for sure. And a be- and a really good one at that. Mm-hmm. But I don't know what else we can speculate until we see the movie. It's only three days to go for the UK. Yes! Yeah, which for some reason we're getting it two days earlier than the US. I'm not I complaining. I don't know why, but I'm happy with that. Yeah. But the thing is, which... With this film, and from what the trailer suggests, someone gonna die. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, from what uh, we've seen in the trailer, where we see the pumpkin bomb get thrown and Tom trying to catch it, and we obviously see Happy sat in the car, and we see that big explosion where there's a car that's being blown up. But it did make me think, is Aunt May gonna die? Or Happy gonna die? Or both? I would argue Happy. I think Happy might die in this. Mm. But is there any more you want to add to this discussion today? (sighs) 
there is there's just so much but only thing is there's so much in this film which just makes my brain just hurt and only thing is after we see this film i think i finally might be able to sleep at night but then you know there is going to be another theorycraft episode where we're going to be sat here go up talking about some plot holes which will likely come about mm-hmm. but when it comes but when it comes to this film i never imagined that I'd be at the age I am now, 25 years old, very nearly 26, and in one lifetime, we've seen all these different Spider-Men, all these different villains, and now, all in one. You know, what a time to be alive. Oh, yes. <laughs> and so, we're going to be seeing it on the Wednesday, and I'm sure we'll keep you guys updated, and whether you want a spoilers one, or you want a non-spoilers one, which is going to be extremely difficult but oh, no, we'll I mean, it a good go I mean we could g- give it a spoil free movie it'd only be a five minute video it's amazing right that's it Yeah. <laughs> although if we do give you a spoilers one we'll give you plenty of warning in the first five minutes just so you have plenty of time to turn back yes <laughs> but there we go folks it's been a while since we've had a chance to nerd out we are trying to get some normality again so, thanks for joining us. It's two dudes that love to rant, rave and ramble all things sci-fi and comic booky. And again, we'll see you same time next week. Stay safe, stay home, don't have any naughty Christmas parties. See you later. And enjoy No Way Home. We'll see you then. <laughs>